I'm John Strickland. I'm delighted to be here again at the World Travel Market this year to chair a number of our aviation sessions. <laughs> and I'm glad you managed to get in because, of course, the exhibition has only just uh, opened it literally in the last few minutes. So good to see we have a, a building load factor at the moment for this first session. Some of you may have been here five years ago when I, I interviewed our guest this morning for the first time. And I'm sure most of you will be familiar with uh, the large European low-cost airline Wiz, but perhaps you don't know. It's already 15 years old. It's now flying over 35 million passengers a year. It has 25 bases in 44 countries and over 100 aircraft in its fleet, but it's still on a big growth trajectory. One thing that hasn't changed since the beginning is the CEO. He was very much the brains behind the airline, so let's give a warm round of applause and welcome to the Chief Executive of Wiz, Joseph Arradi. Joseph, welcome to World Travel Market. Good morning, John. For Thank the second you. time. Now, I was going to remind you, we did this interview, I think, five years ago. And I remember you said at that time, as we were walking to the interview, be gentle with me. But I think if we look at uh, the trajectory of Buzz, uh, Buzz, that's the airline I used to work for, Wiz, I don't think you really need anybody to be gentle with you. It's been a very robust airline. No, you can be a little rude with me. No, we are in a better business. We are in better shape. So you can ask whatever said, you want. I said, no, that's pretty well uh, self-evident. But let me call, call it a rematch, I suppose. Five, five years on but anyway good to have you back here in London and good Thank to you. see that Wiz is still on the rise uh, I remember last time I asked you a bit about your personal history and uh, I, I remember some of the things you, you told me but maybe the audience is less familiar you actually came from an FMCG background I think Procter & Gamble mm -hmm. so what, what made you leave what I assume is the, the higher margin secure world of FMCG and move into the airline business well I, I can tell you that I worked for Procter & Gamble for about 10 years and when I left the company and I joined the industry and nobody really understood what I was doing including myself and at that time I thought I was making a huge mistake and you know I was in a high margin um, a business very big a blue chip company and I went to a little tiny airline called Malay Hungarian Airlines at that time losing a lot of money uh, full of organizational problems and business issues and uh, I just didn't know what I was doing but in hindsight I would say that uh, probably that was my best professional decision I have ever made because that led me to, uh, to Vizer and as you can see Vizer today uh, it's a very successful uh, business and really uh, I think the inspiration of the airline business from a, you know from a leadership perspective is that this is a business you have to manage against the unknowns uh, there are lots of factors affecting the performance of the business simply you don't know what's going to go wrong uh, the only thing that you know is something is going to go wrong and that's the way you manage the business and I think you're right that, that is the way airlines have got to be run, haven't they? Uh, there's a crisis almost every day, even if it's not directly affecting the company. There's something big going on. It's not an industry for someone who wants an easy life. No, definitely it's not. probably easier to stick and sell the soap powder or washing up liquid uh, with uh, Procter & Gamble. But you said you had that time at uh, Mallet, but you, you, I know you, you told me uh, last time around you tried your best to make changes in Mallet, but did you leave before Mallet finally disappeared? Were you already on to the business planning for Wiz at that point? Oh, I mean, I only spent two years with, with Malev and it was more like a stepping stone into, into Visa. But let's just put it straight. I mean, I was fired from Malev uh, <laughs> and uh, I had to find a job and I thought, well, this is an opportunity to, uh, to start a new airline and that became Visa. And it's amazing, as we said, it's now 15 years since that happened and maybe a lot of people are skeptical that we could see a low-cost airline, uh, particularly in the east of Europe. But Eastern Europe is very much, you know, the cornerstone of your strategy, isn't it? T tell us a bit more about that. But if you look at Central and Eastern Europe, it's a very sizable population base. I mean, we are talking about more than 200 uh, million people. Depending how you define Central and Eastern Europe, actually it can be defined as a 350, 400 million uh, market if you include Turkey and, and Russia. And these markets are yet underdeveloped with regard to propensity to air travel, especially compared to the West, Western Europe or, or, or North America. And I think that's the, the single biggest opportunity in the marketplace to stimulate traffic and get, you know, the airline sector in line in line of the performance uh, of, of Western Europe. And this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to bring people into the franchise of flying. If you look at, uh, you know, some of the more development, uh, some of the more developed countries in Central and Eastern Europe, like Hungary and Poland, still today, less than 20% of the people fly. So 80% have never taken a flight. So that's the challenge to us, how to get that 80% on board of our flights. And obviously to win that market and to deliver the strategy you have 
to lower the barrier uh, to market entry to the consumer to an extent you can, and you need to become a very efficient, um, a super low cost, uh, very low fare airline to make sure that you are getting uh, consumers into the franchise. So that's the business we are in. I mean, I'm amazed really that figure 20%. I mean, assuming that varies quite a lot between countries, what would say Hungary and Poland now be quite a lot higher? Oh, but actually, this is, but these are the numbers in Hungary and Poland. Right, I mean, amazing. still, you know, 80% of people have not flown. Really incredible. Now, along with the diversity of, of the, the populations, there must be political challenges as well. I mean, because we see today government changes. I mean, the challenges politically all over the world, but the east of Europe seems to be a particularly tough one. Is, is that an extra complication in running the business successfully and with a, a good continuity in the, in the east of Europe? Look, I mean, my, my view is that without trying to play politics here, that the, the heydays of, you know, kind of the liberal, uncontrolled, global mm -hmm. capitalism uh, might be over by now and I think the pendulum is now swinging back uh, to some extent and you see national interest protectionism uh, schemes coming up uh, promoted by governments and these are the governments which are put in place to uh, exercise power. I don't think this is just a Central Eastern European phenomenon. I, I think you see it across the whole globe. I mean you see it in Western Europe, you see it in North America, you see it all over the place. Um, I mean simply the world is going that direction at the moment and maybe that is going to be some correction in between, you know, the two stages like the late, late 90s and what we are seeing uh, today. Um, it's just what it is. Uh, I think that's what you need to deal with. And, you know, that takes me back to the first uh, comment I made that uh, this industry is affected and impacted by so many things. Mm -hmm. You just don't know what it is you need to deal with at a time. I think we're going to be seeing more regulatory challenges. We're going to be seeing more political influence uh, on the business. But having said all of that, uh, um, people want to fly. I think this is a genuine consumer need, irrespective of where you are, whether you are in Western Europe, in Central East Europe, or Asia, or Africa. You want to fly, you want to have mobility, you want to discover the world, and this is what we try to do and we try to enable ourselves. And I guess where, where we see the political landscape changing, and, and a lot of leaders around the world now are under this kind of banner of populism, if they want to appeal to consumers, the last thing they would want to do is take away access to affordable flights that they their consumers who are possibly their voters actually want. Yeah, that would be pretty stupid. Yeah. I don't think they will do it. What about, uh, one question I had for you about Poland in particular. I mean, Poland you know, still has the, the national flag carrier lot. Um, it's quite a dynamic airline. The market, of course, is a, a key one for you. But that airline under the new political regime there seems to be uh, you know, getting quite a lot of uh, government encouragement. There's going to be a new airport uh, with the ambition to be a hub. Uh, a couple of other airlines that I've spoken to have said there are some challenges even in the freedom to operate day to day turnaround times or fueling and so on in Warsaw uh, is that something you see as a particular challenge well I mean you can use Warsaw as an example but you can use many examples in Europe I mean how is the Dutch government protecting the interest of KLM how is the French government protecting the interest of Air France what's going on in Italy why is all Italia still flying totally illegally from a legal point of view if you look at the EU laws and regulations. Uh, Poland is just another brick in the wall. Yeah. Uh, yes, there is protection going on. Um, you can argue that the market is distorted. But again, you are seeing it all over the place in, mm -hmm. in Western Europe as well. Uh, and this is what I said. You will see more regulations. You will see more politics coming into play into the airline industry. Uh, simply, you have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And in terms of your network decision, so what ultimately decides in your mind or your commercial team where you place aircraft as you grow, move forward? Maybe you are expecting me to give you a very sophisticated answer. Um, Hopefully I not. think I think we are very entrepreneur. Um, yeah. We are very proud of uh, carrying the flag of low cost into new territories. Yes. Uh, whenever there is a market window opening up, uh, we tend to jump on that, and we tend to take the risk uh, with opening a market. I mean, as said, uh, we are in the in the business of stimulating the marketplace. You don't have a lot of data points um, in many of the instances, so you do a bit 
bit of a guesswork and you do an entrepreneur work uh, to start something and obviously uh, you try to ferry by it on a financial basis and at the end of the day we are not in the charity business so we need to make money and I think we are very disciplined on that uh, so every single route we operate has to be structurally profitable uh, we haven't found a better strategy than profitability so we don't fly routes for the sake of flying or for whatever considerations the single guiding principle we apply in network development is profitability and talking of profitability we're, we're here in London and I, I, I think back to five years ago when we, we met before WTM <laughs> you were already a big player uh, in the UK market but we've now got this Brexit challenge you know officially we were going to be out of uh, the EU last week but we're are, you, are you sure we're, we're, well at the moment I don't, don't think okay. anything is sure so we're still there for now you already took uh, proactive uh, measures to ensure that whatever happened soft Brexit hard Brexit no Brexit whatever you were able to operate so you got yourself a UK license uh, the AOC uh, airline operating certificate but having been a big player you then moved on to actually put a base here so even once we knew this Brexit situation was underway you announced I think after that we're going to now make a base at Luton tell us a bit about that because it's an amazing step forward yeah well I think I would start saying that since the Brexit vote Vizair has grown over 60% of capacity in the UK so we are still very confident in the UK market uh, we like uh, the UK market we like our performance in in the UK uh, we are very efficient I think uh, with the margin now we are the, uh, the lowest cost carrier in the in the entire UK market and obviously when you are in the business of, of commodities uh, lowest cost wins and lowest cost prevails I mean let's not forget that we've upgraded our operations uh, in the UK we are now flying almost exclusively AC 21s um, a, a few of those airplanes are actually the AC 21 Neos uh, and that airplane is the most efficient aircraft in the world uh, today uh, and that's the fleet what we are building uh, right now so we have mm -hmm. you know created a very efficient and very profitable operating platform in the uh, in the UK and you can look at Brexit many ways I mean you can look at it an issue, like an issue here or an issue there I think we look at Brexit as an opportunity for us uh, we think Brexit is going to shake up the market uh, you're going to see airlines fading already you are seeing airlines fading Monarch went down Thomas Cook is down and God knows who else will, uh, will, will follow them and you know we are looking at those opportunities and actually we try to take advantage of that of that market consolidation so the UK remains very strategic to us irrespective of what happens to Brexit we put in the the platform operationally and legally uh, that make us compliant uh, with any circumstances and any outcomes of Brexit so we have an airline here uh, we've already got uh, designations from the UK government uh, so no matter what happens I think we will continue to fly and we will continue to service the market I mean I think what, what was interesting is when you mentioned before about uh, being entrepreneurial but being utterly profit focused what I've seen since you've had the base in Luton you've not only increased the scale of operation but you have switched emphasis away from your traditional uh, Eastern Europe which is still a major part of your activity but you're now flying to places like Iceland you're flying to places in southern Mediterranean like Italy and perhaps Wiz maybe I'm wrong but perhaps Wiz is less well known in the minds of UK customers unless perhaps they were they were coming from Poland or, or Hungary for example how are those routes going assuming they're going yeah. well if you're following the mantra of profitability well I mean you know the one thing I can tell you is that we started operating beside UK a good year ago mm -hmm. and that airline has been profitable since day one right I think it's showing you know the efficiency of our business model and uh, and the strengths of the market from a visa standpoint and we look at London especially as a core strategic market for the long run for visa London is the, the world's largest travel market with a margin I mean it's bigger than New York is far bigger than than Paris and we think that if you want to be a long-term structural winner in the airline industry in Europe you have to position yourself in London so this is what we are doing by flying inbound and also by flying beside UK as a as an outbound mm -hmm. uh, airline so we will continue to build our presence from a London standpoint we used to be looking at London as a destination market uh, but with the change and a bit of a shift uh, in strategy now we are looking at London on its own merit and we we try to serve the customers of London not only the inbound traffic but also the outbound traffic and you, you in several London airports now as well which is another step uh, Gatwick I can't remember how long you've been in Gatwick maybe a uh, couple of years uh, yeah but South End is a new one I think mm -hmm. only a few weeks ago isn't it 
for it. Yes. So quite, a, and that airport only had about 4,000 passengers a year yeah, a few years ago, till I think EasyJet began. Now you know you started, I think, uh, two or three routes. Yeah. Well, London, London is is a great market uh, in terms of demand, mm -hmm. but it's a difficult market in t in terms of getting access to infrastructure. Right. Well, Luton is getting stuck. It's full. Um, Gatwick has been full for a while, and Heathrow is completely full. Um, then you have Southend um, that offers some capacity uh, to the market. So it's not only that we are playing the um, the supply and demand game mm -hmm. uh, in its traditional market sense, but also now we need to play the infrastructure game, in uh, how to get access to the market. So that's uh, what we are what doing. What about Stansted? I guess Stansted maybe overlaps a bit too much with Luton uh, from, from the point of view of your network. Um, yeah, I mean, um, you, you have a big sure beast. You, you, you have a big beast in, uh, in Stansted, and I'm not sure that you want to irritate the yeah, lion. Too close. Um, too close. Um, so, uh, you know, they are doing whatever is right for their business. We are doing whatever is right for our business. So we are much focused on, on Luton uh, primary, but as we are uh, sort of getting stuck in yeah. terms of our growth ability in, in Luton, we are looking at alternatives. Now, another market that you came into, I think, roughly uh, in the last year, which also seems highly competitive and where that same big beast is present, albeit under a different name, is Vienna. You know, that, that looks to me like a bit of a bloodbath. I mean, everybody's in there now. It went from nothing to everybody. Is it the same situation there? You're finding your way that you're going to be one of the survivors in Vienna yeah. because I think there's going to be some fallout there. Somebody's going to go or cut back. I think Vienna is a fascinating situation. You just think about what's going on in Vienna. For decades and decades, Vienna Airport was protecting the monopoly of Lufthansa, mm -hmm. the Lufthansa Group. So Lufthansa acquired Austin Airlines and basically uh, over 70% of the total market of Vienna went to the Lufthansa Group, which was a nonsense and it was unprecedented when you looked around in Europe. There was no competition the market was overcharged and customers were ripped off. Um, obviously, the airport had to recognize that that's not the way to go because the airport was not going um, anywhere uh, while all the surrounding airports were growing like, like hell. So they changed commercial strategy as a result. They started attracting airlines like ourselves, but also other, other local carriers. And all of a sudden, um, everyone showed up, put in a lot of capacity. You are already seeing failures of airlines, so you are seeing level pooling out. Mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, is stepping uh, backwards. Uh, uh, Eurowings is, um, is taking capacity out of the market. Uh, the two airlines that keep pushing um, are Lauda and, and ourselves. Mm -hmm. We think Vizair is certainly going to be a structural winner um, for two reasons. One is that our financial performance is by far the best. I mean, essentially, we have been growing in Vienna uh, on the basis of a break-even um, financial proposition. Right. Lauda reported 140 million loss uh, 2018. So they are losing their shirt. Mm -hmm. They still push, but they are losing their shirt. Um, and the second reason why we're going to be a structural uh, winner is that we have only an AC-21 operation there uh, with brand new aircraft. Uh, our cost advantage in the market must be at least 20-25% to anyone, including uh, Lauda. And again, you are in a commodity business and in commodities, lowest cost wins. Absolutely. No, fa fascinating what you say there. Now, on that point of financial performance, I know you have results out, uh, H1 results yeah. next week, so I know I can't uh, ask you any details about that. But financial performance, the year to date, that is in the public domain, has been very strong, as it was last year. Your profits are on a, an upward trajectory. They're very, very substantial. Uh, last year, 292 million euros net profits. Obviously, uh, you've explained you are a very focused low-cost carrier, but you seem to be, in a way, also, even amongst low-cost carriers, bucking the trend. We're going to have EasyJet results out ne later this month and they've already indicated they will be lower profitability than last year. Ryanair is flat profits. When I've looked at your results in recent months, all the right indicators are going in a, in a positive direction. Revenues up, load factors up, unit costs down. How, how is it in general terms that you can speak about that you're managing to do that and the other big guys don't seem to be quite doing it? Yeah, let me, let me give you a few highlights mm -hmm. uh, of what's driving the business. So if you look at uh, average seat count per aircraft, we are now flying a fleet with an average seat count of 202. So mm -hmm. on average, every aircraft carries 202 seats. Ryanair is 189, uh, EasyJet is 160 something. Uh, aircraft efficiency drives 
cost performance and cost performance drives profitability. If you look at profit margins, on profit margin in 2018, Visa Air was the best performing airline compared to anyone. For the first time, we were more profitable than Ryanair. If you look at unit cost performance, X Fuel, this is really what you control as an airline. Yep. We are the only airline in Europe um, where unit cost keeps going down. In every other case, with every other airline, unit cost is creeping, unit cost is uh, going up. So when you put together the picture, it's fairly obvious. Again, you are in a commodity, lowest cost wins. If you are the lowest cost producer, and now we are the lowest cost producer, um, then your profitability is going to shoot up and you're going to outperform the industry. And I think we'll continue to do that. Uh, with the development of our AC21 Neo uh, delivery program and our simplified you know, business model. We are not proliferating brands. We are not uh, acquiring AOCs for the sake of you know, making life more complicated like some of our... Uh, You're not going to go to the whiz group structure, no, no, we are, IHE we, style. We are very focused as a, as a business because simplicity, cost performance, uh, we think are the key drivers of the business structure going forward and we are just sticking to the model uh, uh, but we think we are fairly good at and we're just going to do that better and better every day. Now, you've mentioned several times uh, already the, the fundamental of the fleet, and I, I want to come to that point specifically now. Uh, I mentioned that you have over 100 aircraft. The, the last recorded figure I have is about 120. But by 2026, you're going to be up at nearly 300 aircraft. I mean, this is a, an amazing growth uh, path. But as you said, you're moving out of the smaller A320 into the 321 and the 321, 321 Neo and the LR with these massive seat counts. Tell us about the, 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 the basis of that order, because you have a shareholder, Indigo Partners, who may, maybe some of the audience are not aware of this group, but of course a major player in the industry and invest in three or four low costs. They went into Airbus and put in an order on behalf of all the, the, the members of the family, so to speak, for over 400 aircraft. That, that must give a massive, a massive advantage, as well as the aircraft's efficiency <coughs> in the cost of acquiring and running those aircraft. Well, if you look at our strategic position today with regard to access to capacity in the future, we have access to 270 A321 Neo aircraft, which makes us you know, the airline with the largest order book on hand of any European airlines. So simply, we have better access to the best technology than anyone else in the, uh, in the industry. Two, because of the Indigo umbrella order, uh, ordering 430 aircraft, you can imagine that we got the price right on the aircraft. Mm -hmm. This industry works as such that aircraft gets priced on the basis of volume. Three, we are an investment grade um, rated uh, business. Mm -hmm. As a result, our financing cost is dramatically down versus our historical performance on raising capital. So when you add up all of that, uh, simply there is not going to be another airline you know, that can do better with regard to fleet efficiency and fleet economics than we're going to be delivering. And that's basically the fundamental driver of growing from 120 aircraft today to 300 aircraft in eight years. Now you mentioned also the aircraft themselves have, uh, I haven't actually been on, on one of your higher density uh, 321s, but it sounds phenomenal. I mean, 239 or 240 or so seats. What's it like as a passenger experience? I mean, you said it's a commodity product, but it sounds incredibly tight. I think the passenger experience is great. You yeah. know, uh, a core streamlined of the, seats. Yeah, but, but you know, the core of the passenger experience is that people don't want to be ripped off. You mm -hmm. know, when they are flying two to three hours, that's a fa fairly functional product what yeah. you need. Uh, why should you play three or four times more? You know, for flying BA or Lufthansa or or whoever. Um, two, you are flying a brand new aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, the average age of our fleet is four years. If you look at the average age of the, the legacy carriers, you know, easily 12, 15, uh, 15 years. Uh, you know, we are more environmentally friendly. Uh, so if you are concerned about the environment, you should be flying this because our emission rate is by far the lowest compared to anyone else in the, uh, in the industry. Um, you know, we have a great cabin crew, so you're going to be entertained by, by them. You know, you can buy whatever you want to buy, you know, to, to treat yourself. So, so what else do you need? Mm -hmm. 
Now, in terms of uh, the aircraft, uh, you, you, you first of all went for the 321neo, and I think now some of those orders have been changed to the XLR, which uh, Airbus announced a few months ago. Uh, do you envisage really going into much longer distance flights? I think I saw you quoted a, a few months ago, at least talking hypothetically about you know, going as far as India. You you already go to Dubai and Israel, but would you really consider doing something like that? Yeah, I, I think the way to put it is that the span of our markets today are from the Canary Islands in the west to Dubai to the east. Um, so this is like a span of 10 hours. Today, our longest flight is six hours. Um, and basically, if you take the market as a 10 hour span, we have a lot of unconnected points within that span. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is what we are trying to accomplish with the, uh, with the XLR. So don't think of us like, but these are the guys going North Atlantic, or you know, these are the guys who will be the next uh, long call low cost carrier. That's not the objective. Right. The objective is that we are already serving the customer on, on a six hour flight, and the customer is prepared to pay for that experience and we think you can go beyond that and add another two hours and get the customer satisfied on that range as well and this is what we are going to do. So to an extent you're willing to look at more or less any any geographic radius that fits that criteria where you believe there's a market that can be served profitably? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. North Atlantic you say probably not. Why would you say that? Because it's just that's ultra competitive and we see kind of low cost airlines struggling there or who have struggled. <laughs> You know, the, the operational parameters are also different. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, you, you have to have a differently classified aircraft to fly over the Atlantic. Yeah. Um, you know, aircraft turnaround times are, are different. Uh, cost of infrastructure, cost of crew are, are different. So we don't want to change the business model. We want, to, we want to stick to the very same business model that we are operating today. We are just extending the range to the customer. Mm -hmm. For so long as we can do that without jeopardizing, you know, the basic cost performance of the business, we consider doing it. If you can't do that, we won't do it. And looking at, I mean, long haul low cost, you don't see whiz kind of morphing into long haul low cost. What do you think about that model generally? To me, the jury is still out. I can't see anybody who's really done it successfully long term at sustainable levels of profitability. Well, I think it will get done at one point. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure this is going to be this. Again, right. I said we are not trying to set up a long haul low cost carrier uh, here. Uh, one of the problems of long haul low cost today is that you don't have the right equipment to serve is the, uh, the market. I don't think wide body is the answer. Mm -hmm. You need to have a super efficient, long range, narrow body aircraft to disrupt the market. That aircraft is not yet out there. And I'm not sure this is the XLR, maybe it's one step further, but once you have the technology mm -hmm. uh, out there, maybe there is a way of figuring it out. I don't think this is going to happen short term, in the next uh, few years, maybe on a five to ten year horizon you mm -hmm. have a chance. Ultimately it will happen at one point. I think long call low cost is going to be evitable at one point, but I think it's more of a medium, longer term medium issue term. Than, uh, than short term. I mean, Boeing, of course, is looking at the NMA, which they haven't yet defined or, or indeed announced. Yeah. What about, uh, with that in mind, um, challenges that manufacturers seem to be facing more than I remember in, in, in my own uh, experience with delivering this new technology? Uh, uh, do you think they are being pushed to their current limit? We've, we've seen engine problems on various aircraft like the 787 to some extent on the 321 NEOs, delivery delays, I guess you've experienced some delivery delays yourself. Do you think that's a bigger problem than it was in the past? Is it one that gives you headaches? Well, I think if you look at the performance of the industry from a supply chain standpoint, it's, mm -hmm. it's an absolute rubbish. I, I've been in this business for 15, 17 years. I don't think the industry has performed uh, worse than this ever. Um, um, aircraft manufacturers are not able to assemble aircraft. They are not able to deliver them. Some of them are not even able to fly uh, the airplanes. You have the same issues uh, with the, uh, the engine uh, manufacturers. Lots of new technologies have been introduced to the market through shortcuts. So they were shortcutting the process to come to market eagerly and before your competitor, as a result, I think significant compromises uh, were made on the integrity of the technology. So it takes you know, time to mature and go through the uh, childhood uh, disease 
increases. Uh, so that's a problem, and I think the whole industry suffers from that. And probably there has been recently more growth to the industry than expected. So the whole capacity of the industry has not been set up for that. But this is not only the OEM side of the equation. You look at uh, you know, the air navigation system, uh, Euro control in Europe, it's completely stuck. Mm -hmm. It's almost dysfunctional um, in, uh, in the summer peak period. You look at airports, few airports five years ago were begging on their knees for capacity. Now they are declared full. full. Uh, and the necessary investments have not been made in those segments of the, um, of the aviation sector to overcome the, uh, the capacity hurdles. So I think the whole industry is pretty mm -hmm. much stuck at, at this point in time. So it's very distressing. Yeah. So this is a much worse operating environment than what we have experienced ever uh, before. Uh, but again, back to the first question, that's what you deal with. Exactly. It's, it's, it's daily life, I suppose, yeah. uh, in the industry. But yeah. touching on that point, I mean, air traffic control uh, last year seemed to have been a particular problem. Some airlines have reported it's not been as bad, which is not to say good this year. Do, do you have any hope that politicians will get their act together when it comes to, like, CESAR, the single European sky, or do you think it's going to constantly get pushed down the road for as long as people can push it? Well, we were just discussing that, you know, countries yeah. and the politics are growing uh, more towards nationalism and protectionism. Not working together. Uh, that doesn't really uh, feel like well. supporting European integration in a way. And, and here, uh, in air traffic control, you would need to have a European approach. But the problem is that for so long as the, uh, the national interest of France, Germany, mm -hmm. whoever uh, prevails, uh, there is no hope for a real European solution. Europe has to cut this. You know, we have to do it for the country. Either you do it systemically on an integrated basis for Europe, mm -hmm. or you're going to be stuck forever uh, yeah. with the approaches. I, I don't really think it's going to change dramatically in short term. Now, on, on the environment, you touched on that in terms of your carbon credentials. Well, one thing that worries me is I, I'm now seeing airlines on a monthly basis publishing, you know, grams of carbon per passengers, like we're better than you, or we've got, I think Ryanair yesterday was saying, leanest, greenest airline. Uh, I'm not convinced that's going to wash with the public when we see people like this, uh, Greta Thunberg, getting a lot of traction. And understandably, do you think the industry's got to take a, a different approach, or do you think it's even worked out what its approach should be to make sure that it can continue to do its job and not be suppressed or taxed by politicians? Yeah. Look, I mean, I think there is an issue for the industry and there is an issue within the industry. The issue for the industry is that uh, the industry has to deliver that travel at the most efficient way, economically, environmentally, and many other ways. <coughs> Uh, is the industry there? No, the industry is not there. Uh, and the industry is kind of broken down in terms of interest inside the industry, and I think that's a bigger issue, that if you look at the legacy interest versus the USCC interest, those are two very different things. So when the Dutch government, the French government, are talking about you know, taxing the industry, really what they are doing, they are preserving um, the underperforming environment, the underperforming airlines like Air France and KLM. Mm -hmm. Air France and KLM are the worst airlines in Europe in terms of emission, operating very old fleet, fleets, four engines, um, business class. If you look at business class, business class passenger emits three times more than an economy class passenger. So the first thing what you should do is to eliminate business class. Um, um, and you know, we have an interest um, with regard to promoting environmental efficiency. Uh, I mean, we have to be you know, the best performer with that regard. We operate the youngest fleet, the highest seed density, we are achieving 95% load factor. We are full, 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 very efficient in operation. Of course, on a per passenger basis, we emit the least to the environment. You might find Ben Smith disagrees with you on that one. I'm sure. For sure. I'd love to have the debate with him. Just uh, coming back, a, a question I was mentioning to you as we came in. I'm very interested in, in your shareholder, Indigo. You know, it's headed up by Bill Frankie, who I think is, what, 81 years old. An amazingly successful group. Tell me, what is it like? like being part of that group uh, beyond the obvious financial benefits. Uh, I believe you have periodic meetings with the CEOs of a team in the group. And I remember some years ago, there used to be a group of airline executives. They called themselves the Conquistadors del Cielo. And they would meet in a Texas ranch and share ideas. Does Indigo do something similar? I've read that you do meet periodically and you brainstorm and do share ideas across the group. OK, John, you have to be careful with Conquistadors del Cielo because I am one of the Conquistadors. You are one. Uh, I am one of them. Um, well, with regard to Indigo, um, I think Indigo 
first of all is bringing in uh, a no nonsense approach to the uh, to the business these guys have been tested for decades they've been airline executives and they've been investors in the airline sector globally all over the place for a long period of time now you are seeing a lot of private equity money flowing into the airline sector um, I think 99 percent miserably fail uh, in the end because simply they don't get it they don't understand it they are opportunistic but the airline business is not an opportunistic business uh, you can only be successful as an investor in the airline business if you have a structured view on life and you have the experience what you need uh, you know to deal with the uncertainties to deal with all the issues uh, affecting the, uh, the airline industry I think Indigo is qualified with that regard and obviously over time Indigo has been building significant industrial relationships mm -hmm. which the whole group uh, is benefiting, benefiting from, from. Uh, like you know jointly placing an order with Airbus so jointly purchasing engines etc uh, and we will continue to do that uh, for the benefit of the whole group and obviously for the benefit of each of the uh, individual airlines and tremendously I would say that uh, you know just getting together and understanding what's going on in the US in Mexico in Chile in Canada in London in Hungary uh, whatever uh, is a huge source of intellectual um, uh, capital and and that capacity is being used you know for the better of each of the uh, the airlines so I think that's really what Indigo brings to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the table but each of these airlines you know is managed on an individual yeah. basis uh, obviously but we take benefit of uh, belonging to a family uh, that is sort of a higher level integrating platform seems a, a great way of doing things you know, Absolutely. I'd, I'd love to uh, I'd love to be at one of those meetings and hear the chat we've got a very tight slot so I've got to stop uh, asking you questions at the moment Joe and uh, turn to the audience so we've got some can we just get the microphone down the front there's a gentleman here with his hand up quick as we can and then we'll go to a gentleman next to him if there's anybody else further back but I can't see in this light just shout and we'll get a mic to you okay. uh, thanks Joseph Malcolm Ginsburg business travel news two questions one's a simple one the second's more complicated although you went into Israel why did you not follow up with the UK to elect uh, operation with a new airport and the second one much more interesting is what's your view on the IAG takeover of uh, Air Europe um, let's start with Israel that's easier um, look I mean I think we look at uh, airport opportunities we look at uh, route opportunities on a constant basis if I just look at the last 12 months we launched like 70 80 new routes so that's kind of a normal business uh, for us and if the economic conditions and demand conditions are right we will we'll do it and you know we are doing the same thing with uh, uh, with daylight vis-a-vis vis -vis the UK so it may come on board at at, at one point uh, but with regard to, um, to, to IAG, I think IAG was created for becoming a consolidating force in the, uh, in the marketplace. This is the business they are in. Is this the business model what we like, we admire, or we copy uh, as we said? Definitely no. But we are in a different business. Our business is to uh, create a capacity, create an infrastructure for stimulating the marketplace, for getting people into the franchise of, uh, of flying. Their business model is to to consolidate the marketplace in, in Europe, especially in Western Europe. From, from their standpoint, they might be doing the right thing. I think it will be interesting to see from an antitrust point of view how Spain is going to work out and what they need to do and uh, you know, what remedies they need to put in, put in place. But strategically, conceptually, they are doing what they are supposed to be doing. They are doing what they were created to do. Uh, so I kind of understand it, but they need to make it work operationally uh, and executionally. Okay, a question of the gentleman next to you. Good morning, Christian from uh, Romania, Miles.raw website. Uh, the first question, how do you think the market of small flag carriers will evolve in the next five to ten years? And I'm referring here at, of course, Tarom, because you are in competition with them in Romania, Czech Airlines, LOT, and mostly the mm, Central European uh, Airlines. And the second uh, question, uh, as a continuation what uh, to this gentleman here asked, uh, how do you think that the I Iberia goes going over Air Europe will destabilize the Spanish market and the European market as a whole. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I think essentially this is, this is like one bigger scheme. 
Europe will continue to consolidate. Europe will have to consolidate. Uh, if you look at the United States, for example, four airlines control 85% of the U.S. domestic capacity. U.S. domestic is the same market size as Europe as a whole. Uh, so the two markets are very comparable. Um, so especially these small national carriers uh, make no sense. They are inefficient, financially struggling, um, and they are not appealing to the consumer from a long-term perspective. So they are in a commodity business, but they don't have the efficiency, they don't have the cost space to play that game. So I think it's just a matter of time and they're going to go. It's a long dragging process because obviously the, the whole issue is not played out only on market terms. That is political interest, that is all sorts of consideration uh, going into this, um, which you don't control. So it may take five years, ten years for consideration, but directionally, I don't think you're going to be seeing these airlines flying over the, uh, uh, the longer term. And I also think that Western Europe will continue to, um, uh, to consolidate as well. Um, probably you're going to be landing on a platform, something similar to the US over time, that you will have four or five airline groups uh, controlling um, aviation, the airline industry in Europe. We think that Vizel should be one of them, simply because we are the lowest cost operator and we have the ability to grow the market in Central East Europe and elsewhere um, uh, much more than any of the other airlines, because in order to grow these markets, you have to be the lowest cost uh, producer. So we look at life from an organic perspective uh, predominantly, but we think the market will consolidate around us and there will be more mergers, there will be more acquisitions uh, happening to the players and over time you will really see these four or five players controlling the, uh, the markets in, in Europe. Do you see yourselves, I mean, you say you will be a consolidator, do you see yourselves at risk of being consolidated? Uh, you know, there's been speculation in the past about airline groups being interested to put a, a bid in for yourselves, except the share price is pretty high and that sometimes puts them off. Well, look, I mean, we are almost $7 billion market cap. So should someone want to take over us and happy to pay $10 billion, <laughs> I think we would consider it. Great. Any more questions from the audience in the last few minutes uh, of the session? Okay, no takers. Just a, a quick one on digital, uh, Joe. I mean, everybody talks about digital and some people have a good grip on it, others don't. How important is that to Wiz, both in terms of what you're doing with customers and in how you run the business as we're in this age yeah. of an amazing wealth of data available? Well, I think you are spotting it very well. I mean, you have two fundamental challenges. Uh, one is how do you digitalize the interface with your customer? Uh, and if you look at it from that standpoint, I think Visair has been um, always through the most digital airline platform compared to anyone else. You know, we've been selling through the internet. The only uh, distribution platform we have is Visair.com, and we have been usually, usually digitalized on on commercial revenue making, like pricing, revenue management, and so revenues, etc. Now the the challenge is how do you take it to the next level and deal with the entire customer experience on a digitalized basis? You know, we have a huge team put in place. We look at each of the touch points with the, uh, the customer and we look at digital solution to, uh, to each of those steps. And then you have the other issue is, you know, how do you digitalize, how do you automate, you know, your airline operation as a, as a platform. Uh, I would say that uh, in some areas we've done really well. I mean, for example, pricing revenue management. Um, when we started this business, uh, we had six people doing pricing revenue management 15 years ago. Today, carrying 40 million passengers, we have eight people doing it. Uh, and obviously we had to use a lot of digital solutions to the, uh, uh, to the, to the matter. We try to do, roll that practice out inside the company on other areas. Um, in some areas we are doing better, in some other areas we are a little slower. Uh, but directionally it's very clear. I mean, you need to automate, you need to digitalize, because otherwise somebody is going to come in uh, and will outsmart the existing players in the, in the industry. And if you look at it from that standpoint, I think the, the only threat and the real threat to the industry is that someone outside the industry comes in with a totally different operating platform, achieving much lower cost of operation and simply just takes the market away. So you should not be leaving that window of opportunity open to, uh, to anyone. And this is what we are trying to work on. Uh, in the past, I mean, legacy airlines you got bitten by, if you like, the Frankenstein's monsters that they created of a GDS and then sold them and ended up paying to use them. Do you have worries, as you described there, some of the big tech actors, you know, the, the 
the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks, are they something that is maybe a, a dark cloud on the horizon, or well, not even on the horizon, something yeah. that should be uh, concerning to airlines today? Yeah, I think GDS is history. Mm -hmm. I think you can forget about yeah. it. Uh, but if you look at some of the... Um, you know, the new generation businesses uh, that are much focused on consumer insights and data, uh, and they try to project customer behaviors on the, on the base of, of data, uh, I think they are the strategic threat to the industry. Uh, because simply, they can come up with a model of being the, the integrator, so they own the customer experience, they own the consumer, and they sort of outsource the operating model to uh, existing carriers. Now, again, you know, that we think it's a strategic issue, uh, but we don't want to be in that situation. So I think we need to own our own destiny, and we have to be as efficient as, as a business can be, and we have to own the customer, we have to own the customer experience. That's why I'm saying that mm -hmm. GDS is probably the worst thing what any airline can do, because essentially what you do is you hand over your customer to someone else. Somebody else. Joseph, we are out of time. You've got to rush for a flight as well, uh, trek across London. So a uh, pleasure to speak to you. We look forward to your results being out next week and hopefully getting you back again for a future session, finding out more about Wiz's development. Joseph Verardi, Chief Executive of Wiz. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you, Joseph.